I'm talking about Muslim publics, right? So I'm, I'm thinking of, I've given you more, more or less two papers that cover that. One of them is the religious question on religious leaders, and the other, the other one is on the shrines, the kramats. So interestingly, I started writing this partly because there were a lot of conflicts going on between Muslims and the, in the public sphere. Uh, one of the conflicts was that somebody wanted to uh, build a, uh, extend the, there's a, there's a Kramat in Cape Town. So in 1929, in the Cape Times, this is um, an interesting quote. There was somebody who wrote about the Kramats, the shrines. You know what's a Kramat, Cape Town? I hope the Cape Town Kramats, you all know that. From Signal Hill, round Zanfleet, Constantia, Bakoven, and Robben Island, stretches a long line of Kramats, the tombs of Tuans, the holy men of Islam completing a vast circle within which, if the prophecy of Qadi Abdul Salam 260 years ago is correct, all followers of the Prophet Muhammad will henceforth be safe from fire, famine, plague, earthquake, and tidal wave. Those are the Kramas that are supporting and you know, uh, providing a kind of a... Uh, uh, Cape, Town, Cape people call them Kramats, uh, Mazars, uh, different kind of words that they use. And if you look at the, at the map of Cape Town, they are... Uh, this, is a, this is from the book, The Mazar Society, The Guide to the Kramats in Cape Town. And this is a map that they have, uh, that they have li listed of all the Kramats all the way around, around the city. If you haven't visited Cape Town recently, so you have one, this is the one on Robben Island, for example. You know, a uh, very interesting place that is, in, in the, in the, that is built uh, at least just outside the prison out there. Uh, Mandela talks about it as well. Interestingly, this place was built in 1969, uh, uh, in, during apartheid time. This is an interesting kramat of which I'm writing much more about. This is Oda Krau. It's up near the, near the, the near, on the mountains as, uh, as such. And this is often, many of the kramats have been, they have places that are built around, around them as such. Uh, what happened in the 1990s, you know, in this particular period of time? They were, the owners of the land on which one of these kramats was situated wanted to build luxury homes on the slopes of Cape Town. This is on what is called the Twelve Apostles, overlooking the Atlantic Ocean, uh, probably making a lot of money uh, you know, with, with that land and such. I only thought about it a bit more carefully now, that, that particular context. Somehow I missed that context. But that context certainly was, you know, Cape Town has become one of the most expensive uh, real estate, as you know, in Cape Town, in the area. And this was, you know, using land, converting them into homes for the very rich and making a lot of money. For them. And one of these karamats is sitting on land that was owned by people that took taken ownership of it in the, 19, in the 1950s. So the environmentalists opposed development on this particular land. They didn't want the development to, to be taking place. And so they approached the Cape Mazar Society in order to, and they told them that, well, would you allow, would you give us permission to do that? And they promised them that they would get a, a, a tractor or some kind of an earth-moving equipment. They would take out all of the land, move the kramats from one place to another, and make the kramats somewhere else. Um, you can see that this was the audacious. The Kramat Society actually considered it. I could see that when I interviewed them, I didn't write that, but I should have written it. <laughs> they were actually considering to accept the proposal of the owners because they thought that it could work. What's the problem with that? Okay, we can move the Kramats. It's holy, but we will move it somewhere else. But when, they, uh, when the members of Pagad heard about this, they persuaded the Mazar society to refuse permission. They said, no, don't allow this movement. Don't move the crown. We're not allowing to do that. And then what they did is that they aligned themselves with the environmentalists and they organized a mass protest against this development. At the same time, what happened, what happened in the response is that the Western Cape appealed. So the Western Cape at that time, Ibrahim Rasul was a prominent person there. They appealed to the courts, courts to oppose development. And the courts have written in that, if you look at the the analysis of my analysis of the courts in the paper, the courts came up and said that Muslim cultural rights trump you know, uh, land rights. That the land rights that the owners had, the owners had land rights that were given to them in the 1950s, that rights were not as important as the cultural rights which were enshrined in the constitution. So this was the context. This is the you know, scenario basically to present to you as such. The question that I had raised for
for myself in this the question uh, let me uh, to come to the question is what are, what are what kind of functions do they serve so if i i presented to you the case study about what was going on but i'm coming up with the question what are karamas what are they what function do they serve what what are they we know that they are perhaps they are uh, you might think of them they are immediately they have to do with the you know the the, the question of they are they are burial sites of people who have delivered in the past compared as was said in that uh, in that in the Cape Times article but if one looks at the, at what has happened in the 1990s the question is asked what are the crimes what kind of function do they serve now you know in the present moment this is the question that i posed in my paper so but i first started looking at how the question that i sort of if i look at the question about the, the, you remember one of the things that i said what do what do others say how how do i start entering this discussion uh, not by immediately seeing what is going on but i tried to fry, provide for myself a framework for how i'm going to answer that question what are kramas so i asked to ask myself what are the competing visions of how religion works in society interestingly habermas didn't say that habermas was not interested in religion but what he did say is that society is are engaged in conversations in one way or another the scholars of religion were saying that what he ignored what he should have remembered and this is the adjustment that he should have remembered that religions are also participating in this engagement and scholars two scholars by the name of Eichelman and Salvatori two prominent scholars who have done a lot in this field they coined this term that modern muslim cup come modern muslim publics are formed through new media that means when uh, when you think about you know traditional muslim societies they are talking about ideas because you know through the you know through the khutba through books that they are writing that some people are reading but in modern societies when you have radio stations you have televisions you have printed of books people are constantly discussing and talking about it and that's how you get muslim publics emerging so this is the a theory of muslim publics that is emerged, that that i began to that i adopted for this particular study okay oh. but i was also aware of another theory and this is a theory that says it comes from somebody by the name of talal asad who says no the state decides what is religion so habermas is saying no religions are free to discuss among themselves okay that's one theoretical position asad is saying talal asad was saying no the state decides the modern state always creates religion that is this theoretical framework i'm not going to take too much if you have any questions i can elaborate what it means one of his one of asad's students by the name of charles hershkin argued that, that what you can talk about is not muslim publics but you call muslim counterparts so he studied in egypt and he was saying that in the context of egypt he's saying that the piety movements people who are you know listening to the khutbas that were being uh, circulated through the media in the 1980s by Sheikh Kishk and others so those of you who are listening to arabic maybe you have, le you have learned arabic through listening to Sheikh Kishk he was a very popular speaker a khatib in cairo he was saying that unlike what habermas was saying that this was not a muslim public that was being formulated it was muslim counter public they were not interested in the state whereas people like aikelman and salvatori were arguing that they were producing topics they were very they were they were it was an opportunity for you to begin to see a discussion taking place about society about state and about society about society uh, you don't have to elaborate on it but when you say state decides what is religion so what happens in the idea of secularism then mm, yeah i'll come to that just now i'll, I'll answer that question so i also argued against the secularist thesis he argued that the modern state what the idea of religion why why what he meant is that in a very modern sense not religion as maybe you and i think about right now in islamic tradition as a the Euro european modern state was to say well religion belongs to a certain part of society this is what you do in the church this is what you you know practice as your as, as your ethical tradition religion has got nothing to do with politics it's got nothing to do with uh, you know economics for example he said in that way the modern state creates religion so the creation of religion as a kind of a special sphere of life as distinct from others was the creation of the modern state that's where he was saying 
So therefore, you cannot have a Muslim public that is engaging in, in, a, in, in discussion and deliberation of what, what is the state and what is the society, what should we do on an everyday basis. This is what uh, Hirschkan followed up to show. He gave, the good, very good, Hirschkan's work is a very good example of what he says is that, it's that Muslims, when they, when they do engage with each other, but they're not interested in the state. It's a counter it's not, it's not a public that is engaging. Thanks for that. There's even another, a third theory which I uh, thought about, which I've mentioned briefly, is that religion in Africa is taking over the state. This is by Kheri Tahar and Stephen Ellis, who have done a, quite a number of studies on, on the development of Africa after colonialism. They were arguing that when you look at the, at the post-colonial state, um, if you look at, um, you know, maybe not Ramaphosa, we're, too young, we're, we're still watching him, but if you look at... Um, uh, somebody like uh, uh, Mbeki, somebody like Jake, uh, 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 Zuma, if you look at a lot of uh, political leaders in, in Africa, they were very closely aligned with religion, and religions, religious groups were actually, they were turning much more towards religion than to democracy and modern state forms and such. You know, it's just a theoretical position. So if you, if I, if you stand back for a moment, this, these are the theories that you know, that, that I, I could actually begin to think about, you know, I'm not even touching what is the public yet. I'm just thinking about possibilities of which one is going to work for me. Which one am I going to use in order to explain the, the phenomenon that I've got. Okay. I hope I haven't lost you in there, but I, I think that um, at least this is, it is what, what you can see there. Okay. Then I'm beginning to ask, now I'm coming to, now I have this theory sitting in some way, maybe a different part of my head, but anyway, some way, yes, I've obviously I've written about it, read about it, but what is the discourse on karma? This is my, uh, uh, I'm beginning to now, from the material that I'm looking at, what, how are Muslims in Cape Town talking about the karmas in that context? Remember the context that I presented to you earlier? Now, I'm, uh, I'm going to give you some idea of the results that I, that I drew from what is, this, what is this discourse all about, or what is this discourse. My first, I hope you can see, it's big enough, yeah, it's a bit small on my side. So, first of all, I'm saying that it, it's a Cape Muslim claim on land. That's the, one of the things that I'm getting from there. So, when this discussion and this debate happened about the ownership and the owners and the debates on the radio station, what I'm getting is a clear sense that Muslim, Muslims, Cape Muslims believe, you know, that this is their history and they have a claim to that land. It don't, they don't care whether, you know, ownership, it must be, in, on, the, on the books, for example, it might be, you know, written in the names of the owner, on the owner Kral estates in, this, in the case, but they have a lot of legends they have, that they share among themselves on the Kramas. They have ways in which they think about the Kramas as part of their land, part of their history. Can, I shared with you some of the hist historical. I also found among Muslim discussions the modern ideas on Islam and environmentalism. So on the voice, the voice of the Cape, this was the dominant tradition. So this is where you know, people like Hassan Walele were saying, ah, Muslim, Muslim uh, imams should not only think about prayers and all of that, they should think about the environment. They must begin to think about ideas like this as well. This is very close to what Eichelman and uh, Salvatore were talking about, that these new ideas develop in the modern public sphere. So on the radio, they're not only going to talk about how, this is how you visit the Kraman, this is what you should do there. They talk, they are discussions because Hassan Walele is a very prominent religious leader, but he doesn't have a traditional educational background. He's a Hafiz, he teaches children, but he is a self-made alim, he's a self-made scholar. He's become much more popular through the radio through singing at, at weddings. I mean, he's a very good singer. He always sings these ballads when you go to Cape Town uh, weddings. You should learn that song from him, into Joburg. But anyway, he's a very good, uh, he's a very, very well-respected teacher. But he's not, he's, he is created through the, through, through the modern, modern media. He's self-produced through the media. And this is what you saw him doing in, on the Kramans as well. Then you have theological di di disputes about bid'ah. So this is also comes in. So this comes from the past, right? Is this bid'ah? It is not bid'ah. And the, as, as I indicated to you, how carefully Karan was dealing with that particular particular issue, and how people were responding to him, speaking back to him, right? Uh, you, uh, 
show, I'll show you that as well. And then you have the ANC, right? It's certainly in the, in the, in the person of Imran Rasul, who stands for, equal, for cultural rights and political, uh, political support. So what you can see is that the discourse on the Kramats, you know, is quite complex as such, as you can see. Um, just in terms of the data that I collected and what I could see from there. I couldn't immediately, uh, at the time, go back and see that I would like to fit myself into any one of these theories. I, I, didn't, I couldn't make that decision. Maybe there's just lack of resolve, right? But maybe you can see it a bit better. Oh yes, what, why I have to bring you one more? Sorry, I forgot about this. What is, what is also interesting in my research was the practices at the Crown. Just the, just the idea of people visiting the Kramats, that was also an important part of what the Kramats were all about. I showed you family meetings, the Cape Mazar Society that was going around building, uh, building all of the, the, setting up these buildings, and also the private uh, visits uh, that what, what, what one can do. So my conclusion, my take on the subject was that you have multiple appropriations of Kramats, uh, multiple meanings created, I will explain that, uh, opportunity for human creativity. What I'm talking about here is, is an idea, I didn't ex explain it in my paper, but this is what I thought about in the last two days, because I had to explain to you what, what, what the hell I was doing there. So, I, I think, I, I was probably, I, I mean, uh, the, uh, the idea of appropriation, if you look at, if you look, if you think of, if you look at that word, it actually means giving a meaning to something that is, that, that is not necessarily of it. The word appropriation is normally used in, in economics when you appropriate something, you know, when you, the same word is used, expropriate, you take something away, you steal something from somebody. So when you have ideas that are, when you have karamats as such are there, they have a different meaning, they have a different history, but in the modern world, or in the modern period, what happens is that new meanings are created from, from something. Meanings that were not or, originally there. And this comes from, a, 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 um, a, a, originally, I think it's not, at the time probably when I wrote it, I thought I was uh, as being creative, but I think when I'm looking at it now, and also, also in the last two or three years we've been reading all this work, this is one of the ideas that um, we've uh, sort of imbibed from Nietzsche. Nietzsche's belief was that this, in society, you don't necessarily, things don't go in a straight line. There's always unexpected curves and twists and turns that take place within there. And so this, discourse, this discourse of the Kramats shows us this kind of very different ways in which people, you know, say for you, give, to give you the example, if you haven't read it, give the example of the Urus, you know, the, the celebration of the, of the birthday that I went, I went there. I went to the place because I heard about it, and I, then I started talking to people. But I actually realized that almost nobody knew what the Urus was all about. Who was the person buried there? So the traditional part of it, the way the tradition happens in India, you know the share, you know that you visit the share. But in Cape Town, we don't have a continuous tradition of the, the Kramats with the Sufi orders. Right? So anybody who comes in Cape Town can actually adopt one of these. And this was a, one of the Kokni family's extended family. They, every year they come and use this Kramat as a way of celebrating their family. Uh, another time I, I was on my way to um, Robben Island, and I met, I saw a very large group of people, they also going to the Kramat on, on Roman Island. And then I asked them, what is this Kramat? I said, no, they're going with their sheikh. So I said, who's the sheikh? The sheikh is from Jordan. Wait, who were the people there? There were people from Jehovah here. They were, they were, it was kind of mixed South African group, people from Cape Town, people from Jehovah. But they were also doing their gathering at the Kramat on Roman Island. Also just adopting the place as a way of celebrating. So you can see, that this kind of appropriation, using it, you know, for something unusual, is something that is that I that I'm uh, uh, suggesting here. And my second, my conclusion, my takeaway, as it's said, Muslim publics are not easy to generalize. There is no modernization, and there is no democracy. In it. Now, this is an argument against those people who are saying that Muslim publics are going because Muslim publics are going to be really recreated in the in, with new media. You are going to get new ideas and you are going to get democracy, you're going to get, you know, development within, within the Muslim, Muslim world. This is the idea of Armando Salvatore and, um, and, 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 uh, and Eichelman. But my argument was, 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 the, was, was, the, uh, was the sense that actually this doesn't necessarily prove anything. All you can see is these multiple traditions. I saw that in a little bit more complex way.
stuff. How would you have studied economics in the 1990s? That's the question that I have for you. Okay, so uh, you see, uh, with modern scholarship, uh, we have a very loose approach to understanding anything. With uh, traditional scholarship, you have a manhood, you have a, you, you sort of tie it down, and you have a backing, you have a backbone. So the Quran may be your backbone, or the Sunnah and the Quran, uh, and and so with regards to modern scholarship, I find it's very loose. Mm -hmm. So in this particular article that you have written as well, you would find, for example, invo invoking the awliya is uh, and the help of Al-Qadr Jilani, for example. Mm -hmm. And this is something as a traditional uh, a traditional scholar might look at mm -hmm. and say, okay, we have a base and we have evidence from the Quran mm -hmm. which may be used. Mm -hmm. And this is something that would obviously there would be a, a sense of uh, intolerance towards it or a sense of I mean, looking for... Censure, yeah. Yeah, you understand? Yeah. So, and this would, would, would feature, this would underlie in, throughout, uh, throughout, I think, the writing. So in terms of modern scholarship, doesn't it lack in that, in that sense? And sometimes modern scholarship looks at traditional scholarship and sort of casts it aside, looks down on it. It has that ego-driven uh, and wanting to be different. But that wanting to be different makes it a bit uh, loose and there's no way of actually pen, penning, uh, pinning it down and showing that this is... So where's your evidence? What's your manhaj? What's your, you, you understand? So that... Uh, uh, this is a more broader question, not specifically on this article, but this article also is yeah. an example. Although, maybe you... Yeah, okay, I think that's a good question. But actually, we have a very, very specific... The discipline is quite clear. If you don't do what I'm doing now, you can't get a degree. Actually, if you don't do what, you know, if you, you, if you don't, you basically follow this method that I'm presenting to you, that you don't tell us which theory you're using. It's not telling you, it's not prescribing which theory you should use, but you must have a theoretical belief. You must have looked at other literature. You can't get published. You can't get, you can't get, you can't get a degree. So there is a method. Maybe from your perspective, you are looking at it, you're trying to... I'm just comparing modern yes, scholarship yes, to yes. traditional no, no, scholarship. And I'm mm -hmm. showing how traditional scholarship yeah. has a backbone. Yeah. Yeah. But what's the backbone? What's, what does modern scholarship draw upon? Yeah. It, it becomes very really loose, I think. But I mean, I, I obviously yeah. trying to understand it and yeah, trying yeah, to yeah. adapt to it, you know? I'm, and you're, you're, you're telling me that I'm not succeeding. I'm trying to tell you that you have to follow this method. This is the... You know, it might, you know, I think you're raising an important point because from the perspective of what you are saying, because you want to make a judgment on the kind of things that we are hearing here. So if you want to make a judgment on somebody going to the Kramat, for example, then you are using your discipline in order to make a judgment of the people who are doing this. I'm making a different kind of judgment of that practice and saying that practice comes and contributes to the society in a particular way. So there's a question, there's a very important scholar by the name of McIntyre, who's, who's also a traditional scholar, and he says basically, once you have the kind of a modernist, he calls it encyclopedic scholar, he calls it, uh, particularly he calls it, uh, because of the development of encyclopedia, so he associates it with this kind of scholarship or that, and then you have, uh, what, from his perspective, the Christian scholarship, he thinks that, you know, it's very difficult to, to compare them with each other. Because once, if you if you're going to use what you should what you should begin to see, I hope, and at least that's how I see it, is that the two of them have different kinds of functions, and so it's very difficult to sort of say this is what you know. If you say okay, one of the important questions, say maybe in a kalam discourse, would be, is this permissible, right? Is this permissible? That's a question that you are posing from within. Uh, Kalam discourse or fit discourse for example. But in in what I'm talking about, sociology of Islam, sociology of religion, the development of Muslim to the understanding of Muslim societies, that question is, doesn't come in. Because remember one of the first things I said what I learned in the nineteen eighties that you have to see society, you can't make a judgment on whether the society is actually correct or not. You want to <coughs> your questions are directed towards what is the meaning of this? What is the cause of this? Two important questions we ask. We don't ask whether it is permissible or not. We, our job is not necessarily to say this is unacceptable or so. We might have a critique about it, but that's 
you know, the critique, we, the critique might come to say that actually this doesn't work anymore, you know, or at least from a, if you take, a, say, maybe some, sometimes if you take a human rights discourse, for example, then we can say this is denying somebody else's right. It might seen as a critique, but see it also as a framework that is being brought onto that discourse. So it's true you can say the same thing. I hope you cannot say that I am making visiting the Kramats permissible because I'm not interested in that question. No, no. You see, this, I'm just showing you the difference. I'm not interested in that at all. You might be, you might say, well, why didn't I say that? Am I not a good Muslim to actually say that? Well, actually, I'm not interested in that, in that question while I'm doing that. I might have that question when I'm going home, but I don't have that question when I'm doing this easy. So thanks very much for, for raising that. It's a fundamental question about how do we cross disciplines. From the 1990s, then I guess. Uh, I would have you know, really looked at it as a, a, a contestation of power. Mm -hmm. That probably, uh, you know, you, you women couldn't go to the mosque, but here families were gathering. So there's then that alternative because the platform of the member, all of that. So I guess if I was writing about it, I would have had challenges around using words like, say, the Muslim publics and, uh, and Islam, because I was like, which Islam mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and which Muslims? Because, you know, there's a, the sort of Indian Islam, the Cockney Islam, mm -hmm. the, say, Malay Islam, the Diobandi uh, scholar, the Diobandi Islam, the Badawi Islam. Mm -hmm. And, and, and this is now the, the neoliberal mm -hmm. Muslims, uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the fight between capitalism and uh, you know, um, sort of uh, co uh, or communal property, mm -hmm. the privatization. Mm -hmm. So looking at this as a, as a site uh, of contestation mm -hmm. and these different power yeah. relationships, because you saw the traditional scholar almost had to uh, change Mm -hmm. His approach, because now, you know, uh, his power has been dimin diminished through this, mm -hmm. uh, through the Muslim public's uh, kind of uh, uh, pressure and the communal uh, thing. But I guess you know, I was looking at how I would have struggled, yes. yeah. and I would have struggled around trying to, to, to write about these different Islams and this different idea of which Muslim public. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that that makes a lot of sense to do that. The only that perhaps the idea of a Muslim public itself was not a good theoretical framework. But I'm just presenting to you what I did 10 years ago, right? So I hope you can forgive me for disagreeing with myself. So, <laughs> so uh, but I'm, I'm, it made sense to me, and, and, and because you asked that question, I said that's why I didn't like that. that because we've been thinking about how do you frame the understanding of Islam. And there was a, there's a certain way uh, Clifford Geertz and others have been talking about this, and so I think I've been influence, I found the uh, Muslim publics more useful because it is close to another theory that I was working with, the Asas theory of discourses. You know. But, um, sure. yeah, let me pick yeah. up on this. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Professor Tineb, my question is yes. just how do we work with theory from <coughs> this decolonial perspective or lens? Mm. And also as researchers or like young emerging researchers, where do we look to for new theory and how do we you know, deal with mm. new emerging theory? Because yeah. like you said, it's dominated by this body of um, neo-Western, Eurocentric um, yeah. kind of epistemology. So yeah, what do we do and how should we you know, deal with new theory? Well, I, I will say how, how it, uh, where, where I think you could, uh, I mean, I don't have the answer. I mean, I wish somebody had the answer, but we're all thinking about it at the moment. I'm beginning to see that how people are I'm beginning to take a little bit more perspective on, on where the people, uh, first of all, to start listening much more carefully to what people are doing in the society. Um, I, I've often found that one of the best form of inspiration is actually to go back in the societies and look what, what the people that you are studying are also the ones who are going to be, give you inspiration. Even though you have some bad theories that you are working with, but often the inspiration comes from the fact that actually these theories don't work. And, and how you do it is not by sitting by yourself, but actually engaging with, with questions. So you go into the field. I think the second way is also to begin to see in South Africa and elsewhere, also to, to see what other scholars are doing in other fields. So don't limit yourself only to Islamic studies or religious studies, but if you look at other fields as such in anthropology or in African studies or other people who are doing this, have that conversation and you will think about it as well. 
The third way is that I think in the Islamic studies we have a lot of value in looking at the history, intellectual history of Islam. That's where, I'm, where I often get, as you can see, some of the papers. I think I've often just meddled in it and experimented with them, but I think we need to take them a bit more seriously. To think about, um, you know, and we should not only restrict ourselves to, you know, the, the Sharia scholarship, you know, as such, because I think that is only one of the fields in which this has been developed. I think that they, you should, if you look at the philosophers, you look at the Sufis, you look at the, the, the whole literary scholars, ethical scholars, there's just so much of information. Generally, we, even if we are traditional scholars, we only look at one part of that tradition. And I think that Muslim people like myself who see, don't see, I mean, we're not, we're not, uh, we're not uh, see, I don't see myself as a traditional uh, scholar as such, and no, neither do they see me as, as, as such, as such, or uh, people see it as such. But I think we have not uh, sufficiently seen the continuity between people like the philosophers in, in Islamic history. That is probably where you are, because they are the ones, like say somebody like Ibn Rushd, whom I actually like, because I've read a lot of his work, but you know, somebody who occupied a position that is actually very similar to the position that people are occupying in universities. So, and yet I don't necessarily see that engagement when I look at the history of modern Islamic thought. So that's where I think probably uh, you know all of those areas, possible areas, we could we could we could look at. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I've got two. Abu Bakr had one, but you want to ask questions yes, afterwards? Yeah. After, after the break, we are yes, going to come back. Okay. 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 So thank you. So next, uh, thanks very much.